And back to you, Uli. Take Hello, Stefan. Um, so back back to this welcome to everybody. And uh, somebody needs to keep time a little bit because I realized when we invited seven or eight of our breeders in the Americas to be here and introduce themselves and their farms, uh, we will run into some time crunch. The, the one issue that uh, we already took care of, hopefully, uh, for everybody here has had a chance uh, to watch these videos that were submitted uh, and are now on our new YouTube channel. Speaking of the communications committee, that uh, is definitely one, one thing uh, better than before. A lot of these things popping up there are really great to describe your businesses, our industry, and we hopefully can populate that channel Maybe with a few more videos, I know there is one uh, up and running um, from uh, Curtis that he and his teammate made. Those are great to describe to each other where the butterflies go to, what our guests think about it, and of course, for you breeders, um, where they came from. This is a unique organization where breeders, competing breeders sit together um, some from the same country, some are small countries and are yet cooperate. And maybe we will learn a little bit today about how that works out. Um, as a customer, we're always very curious to know how this operates under normal circumstances. Um, cooperation is always great as Chris has shown with whatever 80, 70, 80, 100 breeders joining forces. Um, but under special circumstances that we've had the last year or two, this has gotten a little crazy, I'm sure. So my proposal this morning would be to allow the America's breeders to quickly say who they are. Uh, they already shown their video, most of uh, you at least, and, and thank you again for that. Some are amazing representations of your place, of your families, of your farms, of your staff. Um, and then elaborate a little bit on where you will be going in the next year. Uh, we all have heard, seen, at least at the board level, understood that there is a lot of pain going around in, for the last year and a half in terms of markets and other things, uh, COVID related or not. So. I would like to open this up as a fairly free and uh, easy way to describe what's going to happen with your farms, with your breeding, with your prices, your market in the next year or two. Yeah. And so you can individually unmute yourself. And I have my order of faces on my screen here, so I don't want to. Uh, put somebody first on the spot, but um, any idea, uh, Curtis or Galinda, how we should alphabetize this? But other than that, I would say I have jo Johanna actually here, the first one on my list on my screen that can maybe start us off with a little bit of a description of how does this work in your in your place? And where is Custom uh, Ecuador, sorry, going with this in the next year? Well, after hitting a rough patch uh, with COVID-19, um, tourism is picking up. I don't know if, oh, sorry, I need to introduce myself. Some of you may know me, some of you may not. Um, Joanna, I'm Rosie's daughter and a new generation of butterfly breeders. So um, looking forward to all the plans that we have for this year. Um, where are we going? Um, so after COVID-19 and being closed for uh, almost six months and no income coming in, we, we thought this has to change and it actually is. Um, tourism is picking up here in, um, here in Ecuador and um, it, is, has responded positively and the levels of visitors have increased gradually. 
Um, one of the political assertive decisions to vaccinate the population has made Ecuador a leading country in reopening the international borders. So that is helping out our exhibition, uh, the exhibition garden. Now uh, we have uh, renovated our breeding areas. So our plan for next year is to increase, keep increasing our production. Um, we are looking uh, to find new buyers around the world and uh, build uh, the biggest butterfly exhibition in South America. And we are already we have started working on on that. We we want to have an indoor area like an indoor garden and also an outdoor garden for that. And we also want to promote and begin to export our handmade butterfly souvenirs. Most of them are made with these little hands. Um, and also, I don't know if uh, I don't know if you know. But probably some of you are already getting our pupa since we have started to consolidate part of our production for export, uh, which has also helped us survive through these last months. That sounds like very optimistic and positive. So that's that's good uh, to hear. Where where exactly? And I shouldn't be the only one asking questions. Please. Raise your hand and, and join in here. But uh, where would you build this exhibit? Right there in Mendel? Yeah, yeah, we have it here. We are just uh, uh, building a new, new area. Uh, for the ones who came in 2007, you saw recording uh, art, but it has changed a lot. And you can see it in the video, it's bigger. And now building the outdoor area is going to. Mm, uh, give a different uh, perspective to the business. So, Mathieu, how do you fit into this picture in Ecuador? Hello. So, um, I don't know if you had the opportunity to watch the video that I sent explaining how I started the project. Um, anyway, um, for as for everybody, these two last years have been very difficult. But until April of this year, it was very difficult. And then from May, it started, the business started uh, really well again. And I think I will do my best year since I started uh, six years ago. So there is a lot of hope, of course, plenty of difficulties. And it's difficult at the moment to uh, make plans for the future. Uh, I also plan to build a new greenhouse. And also I have developed uh, a partnership with two other breeding farms in Ecuador in order to export uh, a better uh, assortment of uh, pupa. So I have a very good choice at the moment. Um, so I think there is plenty of hope and we, uh, from this year, I'm now able to sell pupa and to export pupa every uh, month, which was difficult at the beginning because I had six months without exporting and it was very difficult. I'm trying also to breed new, new species because I, I find that we mostly offer the same species, no matter they come from Costa Rica, Salvador, Colombia or Ecuador. So my plan is also to try to find new species that uh, I'm sure uh, most exhibitors want to, to see. Uh, we also have a small activity with tourism, which has started again, and a chocolate activity. We, we sell uh, now our chocolate tablets, and we have a nice label with butterflies on them. So we think it, we, it will help us uh, to, to develop uh, our project. So this is more or less the, the news from my place. Um. And then I guess we stick with Ecuador and let Jacob, as the the old person in that area region, chime in. Um, I'm not sure how you cooperate, coordinate, or compete with each other. Uh, maybe you can touch on that too, Jacob. Sorry, I, I cut out. Did you just call me the old guy? 
No, that, no, 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 I didn't. Because okay, you have okay. been in the long... It is. Okay, <laughs> no, just, 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 it's, it's okay. I'm getting, I'm getting used to it. Yeah, we have been, more like the experienced guy. We said, yeah, the, um, thank you. Yeah, no, we have been at this for 26 years. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jacob Olander from Heliconius Butterfly Works, also in Mindo. And I can almost see Joanna's farm from where I'm sitting right now. And Matthew is uh, less than an hour down the road. So we... we um, we we mostly I, I think we we collaborate complete and compete and, and get along uh, in general. There's there's lots of points where we've coordinated on things with uh, with Joanna and, and in earlier in the earlier generation with Rosie and Alberto we we co-hosted uh, the ICBs back in 2007, which was fabulous. And and with both Matthew and 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 Mariposa del Mindo, we've been we've been coordinating some production and export activities. So so far, we've managed to to, to work in 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 harmony, which which I hope will continue to be the case. Um, so you know, Heliconius Butterfly Works. We specialize in Heliconius. That's our that's our that's our focus. And and a lot of you have our butterflies flying in your exhibits. Um, like every single person on this call, this last year and a half, two years has been really, really difficult. Um, fortunately, things are on track to be close to normal, I hope, in 2022. Uh, you know, the challenge for us was staying open and deciding to stay open and keep all staff uh, working throughout the pandemic. We, we don't work with independent breeders. So we have 12 people that receive a salary, healthcare benefits, pension plans, scholarships, et cetera. Um, we made the decision not to cut people loose. Uh, we don't work sort of on a gig system with, with independent breeders. Um, and that, you know, that created a lot of challenges. Nobody teaches you how to run a business without revenue. That's, um, that's, that's a pretty, pretty tough thing to do. Um, so, you know, our hope is really to be able to build back after sinking a lot of, a lot of our, of, a lot of our own finances back into the business just to keep people going. We live in a town, as Joanna said, that, that has a lot of tourism activity that completely collapsed during the pandemic. There weren't any other alternative sources of income for most people. So everybody that kept working for us was, you know, sustaining multiple families and family members just to get through the pandemic. So the real challenge now, I think, is, and, and. Um, and my, my strongest desire is for all the exhibitors to continue to grow and, and build back and bounce back because that's what's going to make this work for us. It's, it's you know, we, we definitely dug in deep. It was terrifying um, around mid-2020 when we didn't know whether we were building a bridge to nowhere by trying to keep this going and just digging ourselves into a, a hole that we would never get out of or whether it was worth the investment because there'll be brighter days ahead. I, you know, I'm pretty, pretty optimistic at this point that we are, we are looking at, at the, um, we're still standing and, and hope to still be standing within a year or two years and years time ahead of us. So um, wanted to give a shout out to, to, to IABES for the, the, the emergency support that was, that provided. I think, you know, as much as the, the funds that you help provide to, to some of the breeding families, um, which was important, I think kind of that, that signal that we're not alone in this was super, super important and encouraging to just keep going. Um, and also want to thank a lot of the different exhibitors on this call that really made, you know, everybody is in a different situation. Everybody could do or couldn't do different things, but a lot of people really went out of their way to try to continue to place orders, to honor and expedite, you know, payments that were due and, and pick up the paces again as soon as it was, it was feasible. So, um, you know, I could go down a really long list of, of all the faces on this screen, but I, I just want to thank you all for, for being great partners more than clients in, 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 in making this work. It's, it's just super important. And just, again, both financially and, and the message of support that we got from so many of you was, was, was really valuable. So um, thank you. And yeah, Uli, in sum, I'm, I'm optimistic. You know, we're, if we've made it to here, that's extraordinary. Um, and I think things, things can only get better because they probably can't get worse than they were. <laughs> Thanks. Well, thank you for the kind thank yous. I was not quite as aware of the inf the impact of the, um, the the small, really small donation that uh, yeah, uh, I did for the breeders. Uh, in monetary value, it definitely didn't rise to a lot, but the uh, the good feel that comes with it and all that, uh, I guess, 
the optimism that it might have spread. That that's great to know that that came through and added to this alleviation of abject poverty that we as a breed, uh, as a customer created by not buying you Um Optimism, great. Time to invest, maybe. Vanessa, you have been struggling too and staying in South America, I guess, for going going north, I guess it is. Um, yes. how, how are you? Fine, fine. Going ahead because we kind of go back. <laughs> Uh, it's been a very difficult time last year and not only the last one because of pandemic but this two, 2021 was terrible and very difficult for Colombia. I don't know if everybody uh, well, is aware of the situation, political situation in our country. We had a, a very uh, complicated strike 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 and we have to to deal with the, the closing of all businesses not not only butterflies or anything compared with pandemic uh, all business all social uh, levels uh, works everything was uh, very complicated during one complete month in april and may uh, so we were trying to uh, get up our, our head and again, everything was closed. Everything was very complicated. Um, however, uh, our butterfly farm all the time continue producing. And uh, in our company, I had to set up a different uh, structure. I prefer to, to cut many jobs, direct jobs uh, in offices. And we close our butterfly exhibit. We close two stores uh, in the city, but all of these with the purpose of not touching people in the countryside, our farmers. Uh, so I focused in, the, in, in having running the, the produce, the, the production. And uh, that was the, the secret that we are still alive. And we are running the business only focused to export. And we are the major suppliers in Colombia for very small exhibits, because this is a, a real, a actual a new activity, new tourist activity in Colombia. We, we are not used to butterfly exhibits here in Colombia because everybody had butterflies all around. So they do not appreciate uh, very well inside Colombia, the butterfly exhibits. So we are creating a new culture. Uh, I think for example, in Ecuador, you, you have advantage with this tourism inside the country. But here in Colombia is totally new. Uh, so what we are doing is trying to, to uh, project a future uh, for external tourists, for foreign tourism. And our government is supporting to bring people inside Colombia. Now we have uh, no, no more problems of guerrillas and all this after the the peace uh, conflict uh, documents they they signed together. So unfortunately, the the strike came and many things, but we have the hope the hope to have a better future soon. Um, I'm 20 years old in this business now, uh, and I've seen the, the competition inside some countries that produce butterflies, the tropical countries, Costa Rica, Ecuador. Uh, so I, 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 make, I made a purpose of trying to join 
everybody who were uh, working with Boreal Slice in my country. And I look for uh, each person who, who was working with butterflies to tell them, uh, let's work together as a country. Let's make an association to gather efforts and offer a national um, export uh, production with different butterflies of Colombia. Colombia is a big country, you know? Uh, we have a very, very different thermic uh, floors. And, and I don't know if you received the news, the good news that we, uh, we get the first place in the world of, of variety of butterflies. Because recently, uh, uh, the curator of butterflies in London Museum who is Colombian, she, her name is Blanca Huertas. She's a, she's a very good friend of mine. Uh, she made the checklist of, bar, of species in Colombia. And we finally got the first, the first place. So this is a very important opportunity. And Alas de Colombia, my company, as the first and only one company exporting butterflies during all these 15 years, um, realized that we have a, a very uh, important opportunity in this industry. And I really love this industry. I, I don't want uh, a price war uh, competition this, uh, with, with no loyalty inside my my own country uh, so i want you to to consider and i would like you to hear what do you think about dealing with uh, one national offer of, of export and not different companies i know is not not always the best in many aspects but uh, that's the idea uh, that we can um, handle in the best way uh, prices, uh, quality, conditions, packaging, many things that we know are the best for exhibitors and for our clients and for the industry uh, in a better way. Not, not, not uh, trying to do one thing here, one thing there, um, and offering a good portfolio of species, um, and I, I would like you to, to, to tell me what do you think, and I want to take you, thank you as well as, as Jacob and all, all of the ones who received the, the very special uh, support with that donation, that uh, even though it sounds small, it's, it was, very big for our producers and they are still working on this. In Colombia they don't they don't have many other chances to work in every in everything else. So so fortunately they 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 kept working on the butterflies and my purpose was to protect them before uh, other other jobs in the city. So the idea in the future is to be able to uh, gather a very interesting uh, production and portfolio and offer a, a national export uh, offer uh, for, for the industry and continue ahead. Well, thank you. Um, it doesn't sound a bad idea to me. Uh, I know there are some discussions or tr tricky parts to that. Uh, but we as an association, of course, would support joint forces in general. So having a, a national or a little more wider reaching cooperation of breeders pulling on one string, making export regulations workable for many rather than just one company seems reasonable. And I know Sergio is uh, sitting in a place that has done this fairly well over the last, whatever, 25, 30 years. Side comment, by the way, 
after 20 years, you in the industry, how do you look so much better than Jacob after 20 years in his industry? I don't know. He aged not as well. Um, we, um, you, Julie, we, we, we wouldn't work as a company. No, we would work as an association with different right. people. Uh, details, but, but, but the, the concept is definitely, uh, in my book, a great one. Uh, and I'm not sure we have heard so much from Sergio already. So maybe Michael, if Michael is on, he had some trouble with audio. So if he's here, please speak up. Um, and then as I know that uh, Ernesto is here as well. So both of those are big in Costa Rica, um, moving back a little further north now. Um, are you, Ernesto, are you willing to chime in here and see where we are and maybe also comment on how does international cooperation work and make this as a Joint force. And you I don't have to see yourself. Ernesto. Where is Ernesto? I saw him earlier. I think it goes can I Thomas right now? Can I ask a question, uh, Uli? Please, please do. Um, I would like to to get into the point with the three different companies in Ecuador. Do you send? Um, consolidated shipments to Europe, for example, or to America, or everyone sends uh, her own shipment? Ecuador. I uh, can speak to that initially, and Matthew and Joanna can, can chime in. Um, we don't export together with Mariposa de Mindo. We work supplying their exhibit in part. And with Matthew, we collaborate on sort of an ad hoc basis, depending on, on when shipments and, and clients and logistics align. Mm -hmm. But everyone sends her own, uh, his own shipment. Mm -hmm. OK. We consolidate. We... Oh, sorry, go, Matthew. Yes. No, at, at the moment, we, um, we are two companies exporting. Uh, I export mostly to Europe and Jacob probably more to United States. And um, well, um, I think we, there is one important thing at the moment is uh, there are many different breeders, but on the other end, there are very few uh, companies or people importing pupa either in North America or in Europe. At the moment in Europe, the situation is that mostly two companies are uh, um, importing pupa. Uh, these two companies are in England, which is uh, quite difficult because England came out of the European Union and from next January, it seems it will be even more difficult for uh, England to send pupa to, to the rest of Europe. So um, I don't know. I, I think that here in Ecuador, we have a good relation between all the breeders. And maybe it's, uh, I, I'm sorry, Say that, but it's a shame that on the other end, Europe, um, this is not exactly the case. And uh, uh, I know that business is difficult for everybody, but uh, there there is still some competition, which uh, and it's it's difficult on the other side without uh, saying anything else. So, Joanna, if you want to say something. Uh, I, I was I was pretty much going to say the same thing like I don't like we are starting to work together and like things are looking good over here but on the other and on the other end and polit politics and everything is ki kind of like putting um, big walls to our business and yes uh, some of our production goes with Matthew. We have Mike Rice raising his hand. I'm not sure which Mike that was. Yeah, I just had a comment on this. Yeah. As the cost of shipping goes up and the cost of uh, uh, inspections at the border go up, there's certainly uh, an advantage to combining shipments whenever possible. Right now, such a huge amount of the cost of pupae are going to the shipping companies instead of to the breeders. And so by consolidating, I think there's an advantage to the whole industry. Well, maybe not to FedEx and the other people, 
the shipping industry, but to our industry, it would be good to consolidate things more whenever possible. Um, I would say you are, you are totally right, but also we had a problem this year with airlines because uh, we were sending people from Ecuador to England through uh, United Airlines and from one day to another, they say that the flight from Houston to Europe couldn't uh, ship anymore because there was an embargo on live animals, which in fact was completely yeah. stupid, there was no reason. But the, um, we had to find a solution very quickly and we were able to, to, to work with American Airlines. But if there was no possibility with American Airlines, we were just uh, unable to, to ship the pupa. So I think it would be important to say that we also have, amongst many other problems that we may have, uh, we are depending on airlines, which uh, from one day to another may say, we don't ship pupa anymore because it's too complicated because the plane can't accept any live animals. They can accept passengers, but how can they don't accept uh, pupa? It's a mystery to me. Anyway, um, uh, the solution to Europe seems to be through K KLM, which is very reliable and uh, is shipped to the Netherlands. But it's, it's very tight because we only have this possibility which is reliable. And if for one reason or, not, or another it uh, disappears, then we are in big trouble because we really can't send any more pupa and uh, exhibit can't receive any more pupa. So this is another problem. No, and the not. next problem is, uh, Matthew, the next problem is here in Europe yeah. that we have more and more transport companies that are not willing to take the shipments from Frankfurt to the other uh, European countries because they are live animals. So this is a very, very difficult um, problem right now. And uh, uh, this is the, other, the next step. The airlines are not taking the, the, the PUP, but if they are taking them, then it can happen that the transport companies uh, here in Europe don't take them. So this is really a problem that and we are I'm going to face more and more. And I'm sure that uh, we hear the same from Richard and from Sharka or James later on. I uh, wanted to get back to maybe before we highlight these issues, they're all related, of course, and they're the breeders' troubles as well as our as, as a customers. Uh, give some of our breeders an opportunity to uh, continue to introduce themselves first. Um, we do have Michael from Neotropical here as well. Um, you can say hello and see where you fit into this whole game in Costa Rica. Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Emeros Neotropical. I am here with my wife. Uh, she is talking to you um, about, about this, uh, projects in Butterfly Farm in Costa Rica. Hello, everyone. My name is Viviana. Uh, as he said, I'm Michael's wife. Uh, we are working together here in this uh, project, and it's really a pleasure for us to belong now to this uh, really big organization. So we thank you very much for, for these efforts that you are making. And uh, we really want to introduce you a little bit about our project here in Costa Rica. Well, we, we have a farm and we produce butterflies. We also export butterflies and we work with many families, you know, around Costa Rica. Um, also, we are taking these projects in, in an ecological farm and we are trying to produce butterflies among with some others, uh, you know, agriculture projects as well. So for example, we have a um, um, coffee farm plantation where we produce uh, not only butterflies, but coffee um, and some other, you know, um, fruits or, or whatever that we have here. And we, we are trying to make this project, you know, like working uh, with the nature, you know, taking care about the environment and everything that is really important for us. Um, 
also working, trying to take care of animals, um, you know, like butterflies, bees, everything that we have um, around us. And we also are trying to, um, right now, to build uh, our, our own exhibition or butterflies. So we have this project going on as well. And we are making like everything together. So this is really a little bit about our company. We work with many people. Um, our product also is work, you know, like um, the things for quality and, and all of these things has been working by women. So we try to involve many things and many people between our processes. And we are really, really very happy to belong now to this organization. So thank you very much. I don't know if you have some questions about our company or whatever, so feel free. And we will try to answer you a little bit about it. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um... Do we have a camera? <laughs> yeah, we have, but as we are having problems with the internet, so we are trying to, you know, like take you a little can, bit. You can but, watch the video, it's yeah, on no. the YouTube. Channel. Oh, there you there are. are. Yes. You. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> for, for you, as at least for you to meet us, because as we are having problems with the audio, we decided to, you know, to take off the camera. <laughs> Very bad <laughs> internet in a mountain in Costa Rica. But yeah, we, we, we do are understand. like high in the mountains, so we are not having the best internet. So I'm sorry about that, but thank you for for the meeting and for the invitation. How long have you been in uh, a part of this uh, industry and, and producing butterflies? Um, you know, this is a project that my husband began, began like I think nine to ten years ago as a little idea. So he started there. Even I think this started before because we both of us went to a high school here in, in, in our, you know, in our country. And that is teaching a little bit about these processes. So maybe the idea could start over there. And then he started to develop his own project, you know, like going through many things. And it could be like nine, nine to 10 years about, something like that. Um, I'm afraid we lost Sergio, uh, not Sergio, uh, Ernesto. Um, Sergio, would you kind of, in short words, <clears throat> short words, uh, describe where places like Michael's fit in with your network and Esther's network. I know you are instrumental in coordinating some of the e efforts and working through the problems of expert and airlines not flying and, and, and whatever else is going on. Okay. QP pricing, young people not wanting to join the industry, old people retiring um, without going to too much detail. For the next that's good. I'll be waiting. I will be brief so that we can cover the rest of, of, the, of the participants. But well, for those who don't know me, my name is Sergio Siles. I am the manager of Costa Rican Tomological Supply. Um, for those who don't have all the story context, we were the first company in Costa Rica that started with this, uh, created by Joris Brinkerhoff and, and Maria Sabido, uh, his wife. And back in 1984, so this is going to be the 37 year, pretty much uninterrupted, of dedicating our our, our company and our staff to, to this uh, activity. We do not breed our butterflies. 100% of what we export comes from different breeders account across the country. That I think that one of the one of the achievements, or or let's say. Yeah, achievements that we had after COVID is that for the first time we had to open our books in a very positive way and get to see how many breeders were in the country. We had a, a magical number always going around saying 400 people are dedicated to breeding butterflies in this country. And for all of us was always like a mystery, a myth. And at the end, we ended up uh, with, a, with a total of 90 breeders. Uh, that's why I decided to share in the chat, um, uh, chat of this uh, session the numbers 
that we got from all the countries, because I think that that was something very positive as well from the Philippines and from all the different regions, right? To get to have a better sense on how many people are out there breeding butterflies. So uh, we work with those breeders here. We do not work with 100% of them. So for example, we do not get pupae from Michael. Uh, Michael has his own uh, world going on as well with Ernesto. He has his own world, but we do share uh, the pupae that is coming from the different breeders. Uh, they are supported by the same, or not the same, but most of the breeders that we work with that are part of the network we created are the ones that are supplying to Michael and are supplying to um, Ernesto and other uh, exporters that are here as well that are not in the call. I don't think that they're part of the association, which I think is very important that we all are part of this group. Um, but yeah, we, we do share, let's say, that network. The network it has a lot of production. They are independent breeders and we just buy what we need. And the excess that one company doesn't get is what they start putting into other companies. So that's how, how this um, thing works here. Um, so yeah, it was a challenging rough year. As I said in my video, people were very happy with the support that IFS uh, gave to them. They were not aware of this type of association that was very positive too. Um, clearly the effect of the pandemic hit us really hard. Uh, I think that I have shared a, a rough number that the exports came down by 50%. We only stopped for about three weeks. I know that in other countries was even harder, but in our case, we had to stop like for three to four weeks when our, all the airlines were uh, stopped. And after that we resumed, but clearly at a very low speed. And this year has been a little better. Uh, we have continued to export to Europe, uh, facing similar issues as Matthew was explaining with United from one day to the next saying, we are not moving your butterflies. Uh, or with other situations, as Gerlinde was explaining in Europe, where companies were saying, we don't want to touch live animals anymore, and we're not moving those boxes. So I think that the logistics um, are very uh, unstable. And I think that that's a, a challenging time, at least with the US, uh, Rich and, and all his friends over there are, are still working normally, but clearly lots of, of things have changed. And um, clearly from an economical, social perspective, the country is going through a lot of up and downs. Uh, I don't wanna go there, but uh, we feel, we do hope as well that next year continues to, to, to improve. I have to, I have to say I, I am an optimistic person, but sometimes my realism takes me too deep. <laughs> so um, sometimes I feel that all these vaccination thing in enclosed, in enclosed areas. Um, and this is also something that it will be great to hear from you guys as exhibitors. I, I'm always afraid of how much that those restrictions could impact the level of visitors in your exhibits. Because clearly if you don't have exhibits uh, with visitors, we don't have ways to export. So that's really the biggest uh, concern I always have uh, on how much those things could be impacting your exhibits. But at a local level, production level are high, weather conditions are high, people are excited, people are not going into other jobs while they, some of them had to find other alternatives, but they are still dedicated themselves to, to breeding butterflies. And we still have government issues as the ones that we had a couple of years ago that hasn't changed. But at least the pandemic allowed us to work in a digital way with our government. That was really positive. They allow us to send PDF files finally, instead of us going physically to offices and getting all the signs and stamps and all of that. So that improved a little bit, but we still have a lot of things to fix with the government. Uh, but overall, again, it's a, it's, it's a positive environment with lots of open uh, question marks uh, as we move forward, uh, I would say. Uh, between Michael and you, um, how are government regulations worked against from your breeder industry? Do you have to just take what the government does and 
you have to appease and please, or is there a concerted effort to uh, streamline form those regulations, maybe from your end, where you go together or as a big exporter that crashes? And, well, and, uh, I, and as the, yeah, as I think well. that the, the one thing that happened a couple of years ago is that they, the office, the, the Ministry of Environment, let's say, centralized all the permit approval process into one office in downtown San Jose. So Michael has to, well, he's about an hour and a half from San Jose. We are about 45 minutes from San Jose. And we used to get the support from an office right next to the airport. So that was the big shift a couple of years ago. And what has changed after that is that now this office says, you need to give me your permits with one month of time in advance before you export. And you need to predict how many pupae per species you will be exporting. And clearly that's impossible. And so what is happening is that we're having to inflate our numbers so that we have room right, to, to play with. But we are now creating a problem because those numbers are going into the official system that they use to know how much we are exporting butterflies from Costa Rica. So the numbers are looking like skyrocketing, right? It's like, this business is great. These guys are exporting 2,000 in each box, right? And so we are having issues now even with other institutions saying, hey guys, what are you doing? Why are you exporting so much pupae? And why are you doing this? And so we now, there are lots of conflicts even between government institutions, like the one that regulates environment is now being asked by the export office, why, why do you have to do this with these guys? So is, is the, the, the bureaucratic thing, right? The whole processes, steps that we need to follow that are the challenge for, for all of us. I mean, Ernesto has to go through the same, Michael, ourselves, all of us have to go through the same. And, and clearly that restricts our capacity to export because when you guys say, hey, I'm opening tomorrow, I got the permit to, I, I, we, the, the city is opening again, we want people tomorrow and we have to say, I'm sorry, we don't have a permit and I'm sorry, it's gonna take three more weeks to get it. And so we start getting into all this, uh, hey, we need your help, please, we need a permit, please, we know it's not a month in advance. And so it's not a very easy way to work. In the past, we just used to get the permit, I mean, prepare the paperwork and go to the airport and says, hey, here we are, this is our permit, this is what we are exporting, this is the box, can you sign it? And they just give it you, they gave you the, the, the approval. But that whole thing changed and that's where we are. And it's creating a lot of noise. And, and in fact, I'm, 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 I already raised on behalf of Press. I didn't did it on. I didn't do it on behalf of all exporters here, but people are um, in being. I mean, there, there, there is a major concern from the Ministry of Agriculture, another ministry, that those numbers are so high. And so they are saying, hey, this looks like uh, even like trafficking of, of a species. This doesn't look right. Uh, you need to fix this. And so we raise a letter up to the Ministry of Environment and say, hey, we need your help. But guess what? Next year, the government is changing. So those ministries are gone. So all will start over again. So that's where we are. It's uh, a bit challenging. Um, I don't want to sound too negative, but if the news at some, I mean, my concern is if one day somebody comes here and reviews the official paperwork and check how much people we're getting out of the country, people will freak out. They will say, you are exploiting Costa Rica's natural resources and this must stop, right? And we have this protectionist view of the world who says, you guys are evil. You guys are playing with God's create creatures and you're exploiting nature. And, and, and that's where we are walking in a very thin line uh, as of right now, I would say. I guess you need a Wayne Wheeling at the airport to who understands the industry. He, has, he doesn't understand his phone right now. It seems he is a little uh, distorted, but 
Vanessa, you, you raised your hand. Yeah, is that yeah, a similar I, I just, issue? I, exactly. I just want to, to tell everybody that exactly what explained what Sergio explained right now, it's happening in Colombia and it's been happening all the time. It's a bit a big headache all the time with permits and with logistics and with uh, official environmental institutions and people who work there that everyone thinks he's he owns the truth <laughs> so so it's, it's it's really difficult that's why uh, we are uh, gathering our uh, or joining efforts to show to these institutions together and, and make a, a big uh, uh, weight. Oh, otherwise, uh, we are fighting alone. And who is Vanessa Wilches? Who is Salas de Colombia? But if there's an association and uh, it's an entire uh, country with different uh, farmers all around uh, struggling to, to find a, a way to, to live, uh, they maybe will listen to us. So that's the same situation. And maybe before we leave South America for a moment, Ecuador has similar issues in terms of permitting changes and basically just chasing new regulations every five minutes. Yeah, I mean, we've all, I think, found decent working relationships with the Ministry of Environment, but it is complicated when new rules come into place. This question of being able to predict well in advance what exactly the, the quantities of export are means that we've got to do basically what Sergio says. So we, we want to be authorized to export maximum this based on our production capacity, but obviously that that's going to vary from day to day, from shipment to shipment. And literally it varies on, on the day, right? When we're when we're harvesting and packing up. Um, so it, it just creates this weird distortion. And I mean, it's all part of. I guess in part it's a normal part of bureaucracy. It's in part that it's similar regulations that govern, you know, the export of a single black caiman or a thousand butterfly pupa, um, and and that you know it's it's a one size fits all reg regulation for large and and very sensitive species um, as compared with butterflies. And yeah. um, we're not we're not quite big enough to get them to, to to shape the rules exactly in in you know for the particular circumstances of our of our industry. Yeah, and I have to make the commercial here now that we have a, such a good space for speaking about this is the importance of buying from good known sources, good known sources of, of, of pupa suppliers, because sometimes we're paying, uh, I don't know how to use that Spanish uh, statement, uh, but we're paying uh, the price for other people's mess, right? Of other people not following the rules, other people not following the right permit process, other people just, just shipping pupae on a box without reporting it to the government, right? And so the government realizes this and says, okay, all of you, I don't care if you have been doing this for 37 years, you will do this. You will come here one month in advance and give me this. So I think that this is really critical for this industry that we really know where we're getting our pupa from. And if you're buying from an intermediary, try to understand who are they buying from. Really try to get it and say, who are you getting your pupa from? Because if you don't know, and if you're just getting pupa from a black box guy or person or company with a nice logo, you're putting at risk this whole thing. I have to say it in this way, maybe I'm too blank, black and white, but I feel that that is a problem we are facing. And here in Costa Rica, we're hearing things of lots of people with other insects that are pu putting pressure on our site because one of the things we had negotiated so far was to come up with a, with a trust and uh, let's say program where if we had enough materials and, and enough information that we have the right processes, the right people that we are shipping to the right places, don't put so many restrictions on us. And try not, and we don't want people to show up from one day to the next exporting butterflies. They are popping up everywhere, like boom, there is a new guy popping and exporting butterflies. And you do not, and, and, and sometimes you don't know where they are getting their people from. And so it's like, okay, if, if the, we, we want to trust on free market conditions, but if we trust on free market conditions without any controls, 
we might be facing lots of challenges in the near term. A lot of challenges because lots of these guys are very narrow. They have a very narrow view and say, no, this is what, we, what you should do. And so I think that is very important that we all of us uh, take care of that. That was an advertisement brought to you by Sergio Siles for Yavis. Yeah. And even, I can, I can, even I can block Chris and, and block this and say, hey guys, I'm speaking as a Costa Rican. And if, if we don't do this, you will get to hear lots of people complaining about it. <laughs> yeah, we, we had this case, uh, this uh, story, and I'm not sure how far you, uh, some of you have read these articles, but uh, that very topic was addressed in a Dutch publication. And we always risk tremendously when some actors jump into the market and, and buy from people that are not quite doing everything on the, on the right path. And uh, Yes, then PETA or the environmental agencies might interfere. I know we have more time uh, with uh, Elizabeth uh, tomorrow as a Philippine supplier. She's joining us and had a question. Elizabeth, you wanted to add something. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, I just like to react to the issue on the um, regulations uh, of uh, on in in the part of cost of Costa Rica where in uh, the pupae now are being now uh, scrutinized by the government on the volume of their exportation uh, in our in my country it's still not the it's still not the the situation. Uh, the government is more supportive of more butterfly breeders, more to breed and more to export to have more money coming in. Uh, our own problem, that's why I left the butterfly pupa export business is the pricing of the butterfly pupa that really went down. So down that Everyone here, the permittees, each one likes to take the buyer of the other permittee and will go even down with their prices just to remove the other permittee. So there is, there is an association but, of which I had, but I cannot reunite everyone with the pricing. And it's really going uh, later on, I think in big, this will be a, a trouble later on for everyone because it's already happened in another industry here. That's, that is the coconut juice uh, industry, which we call the nata de coco industry, wherein the Filipinos, all of them, they were fighting among each other competing with the prices, going down, rock, really going down with the price just to survive until such time that the industry went kaput, it disappeared. So I just want to, I'm also worried that later on it might not, it might happen to the butterfly pupa industry in the Philippines. And I just like to share it with everyone that uh, I think there should really be a, a, a uniform pricing on the pupa to export. So each member can be, each uh, permittee can be protected. Um, and uh, that's, that's my concern. And uh, also to make sure that a member of IABES are also given support and not just taking from another supplier that's not even a member, then you will work for Yabes, but I cannot even control the situation here. There are more and more who are interested to go in. And I think later on it will collapse in the Philippines. It will collapse. It will only take few years. And and uh, I, I like to to remedy this um, that's why I left the, the export business for two years to think about the strategy 
I can do for every one of us here. Uh, but I still have to, I'm still trying to, to coordinate with the rest who can participate. But if they cannot participate, I think some of them will have to be forced to, to get out from the, from this, um, uh, this business. This is my only concern. Well, it's a big concern, I'm sure. And uh, it's great to hear that Central South America is usually very cooperative. Uh, as a customer, of course, we're always afraid that there is price uh, fixing. The Americans don't look upon that very nicely, but uh, maybe we can discuss this a little more tomorrow. There are uh, only two or three breeders we uh, from the in, in the eastern hemisphere that we were going to talk and hear from tomorrow. So maybe that point can be added on to that agenda. Uh, but not to shut Hussein down, uh, who also raised his hand. Hussein? Yeah. Yes, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, um, I have uh, two issues concerning the South American breeders. My first question or query is concerning the issue raised by Sergio on the issue of uh, documentation. Documentation, how was it before COVID? All these, these, uh, these things were introduced, was it after the COVID-19? How was the process before COVID-19? Because mm, you also no. have similar challenges. Yeah, and no. then the other issues, okay, let, sorry. Me, let me finish the two questions in one and then you'll respond to it. And then the other issue is, uh, the kind of documentation you raised to support uh, the shipment, the documents that needed to support uh, the shipment, in that you are told now to prepare advance or invoice in advance for you to get the permit to export the paper. So what kind of documents are we talking about? Because I went now to contemplate on also what we are witnessing here after the COVID-19. I think maybe if I told you are facing the similar challenge also on this side of uh, Africa, Kenya. So are these documents prior to COVID-19 the same or the some other documents that have been introduced just to control uh, for COVID-19 deadlines measures introduced by EU or recipient countries for that matter? Thanks, Zane, for, for the questions. No, the, the documents are, are not new. They, they didn't come after COVID-19. These are these problems or situations I was describing came back in 2018, 19, no, eight, no, it's like, I don't remember. I think it was 2018. Um, so yeah, th these are not new. This is just what we have to do uh, for every export. And basically we're talking about two permits that we have to put for every order that we ship. One is from the Ministry of Environment who is, let's say, in short, saying, okay, you're allowed to export these wildlife animals. That's what they are saying. You're allowed to export wildlife animals. We checked your documentation. You did it right. You are getting it from the right sources. Go ahead and do it. And then we have a second document that says, okay, these species that you're exporting are not going to create any pest problem in the, this, in, uh, the country of destination, right? This, the, the sanitary or phytosanitary or so sanitary permit in different countries, health certificate, quarantine certificate, many people call it, call it in different ways. But it's just saying, this is going to arrive, it's, gonna, it's not going to create any problem in the, in the plants or uh, uh, crops of the country of, of, of destiny. Uh, destination and and they and and for all for them to give us that uh, signature they have to see that this other permit is ready so this is the most important and that's why these two groups are sometimes struggling saying hey what why why you ended up sh shipping only a thousand if this permit says five thousand ah oh, it's because of this and that no it doesn't make any sense i'm gonna sign it for now but you need to change this so now that's where we are and every box and every and every box that you get from if you're if any Costa Rican exporter is shipping to you directly, those two documents should be in the box. If they are not in the box, you're in trouble. 
something didn't happen. And with the consolidated shipments that we ship via LPS or via Gerlinde or via Stratfor, I believe, well, we don't work with, with Shark and James, but um, I know that the bulk shipment should have those two, but after they are delivered, uh, the different ones, the different boxes, we would not have a, a permit for each of those boxes. That's the trick of creating these bulk shipments that, that we just need to go into one single process. Otherwise, we would have to go 12 times <laughs> for each box and that would be very insane. So uh, that's the trick of that. Maybe the second question, if, if I will be allowed to do so. How about the cost of the air freight at the moment? Before, COVID, uh, after COVID? Oh yeah, the, after COVID that's, yeah, that's shifted. Uh, in our case, we have seen increases of over 25% for Europe, for the European shipment. Um, and about a 20, 15 to 20, it's plugged trade into the US. Uh, that's what we have seen. Belinda, you had your hand raised before, Vanessa. Unmute. I am trying to, yes, I did. Um, I wanted to add to the uh, what Sergio said that uh, the um, exhibitors should not buy from anybody. The same thing is that the exporters should not sell to everybody because they are in Europe, for example, we are getting offers uh, every two or three weeks from somebody new and they get the pupil from somebody and, and they are not, uh, we are not aware who they are. So they are buying from somewhere. So the same message that Sergio did to the ex, uh, to the exhibitors should be for the uh, suppliers too. This is what I wanted to add to Sergio's comment. Vanessa. Ready? Okay. <laughs> I, I wanted to add that we use the same two uh, permits as Costa Rica. But uh, in addition, we have to, to move with a safe permit of movement. Uh, we have, we here we, we, we call it salvo conducto. It's, it's like uh, when, when you move with a weapon, the same. <laughs> and they say uh, exactly the number of pupas you, you are allowed to move. Uh, last week, they uh, made a... a the commi the, the commiso uh, because we were nine extra pupas uh, in the package so so that's that's the the things the things we can we have to deal with here in Colombia that's that's we are uh, joining all the the companies we are producing butterflies here to try to to work in this activity, otherwise it, it wouldn't possible. Wayne added a comment in the, in the chat to maybe try this on a higher level to find a political remedy and a, and a, what do you call it again? National UN, uh, let me see here, um, to, to rally to get these processes streamlined and these permitting streamlined. Maybe as a good segue to some degree, Rich is providing a lot of these pupas, bringing them in and describing the headaches that we as customers uh, only marginally get to hear about. Uh, what's your thought there other than this is hopeless on our end as well in terms of pricing more so than permitting because again, we have Wayne on our side that understands the process and the details for the most part, but then there are all these bean counters that might count nine extra pupa and say this is not permitted, even in US ports, I guess. Well, my my uh, thought is I'm staying out of each country's political problems because every country, every shipper has headaches. It is painful. Um, you know, the idea of getting it from there to here is my focus, but there's really not much I can help. Every country has their issue. I can put my two cents in and say, 
The U.S. would like Cuba from your country, but it has no clout. Now, pricing, I recommend, you know, I, I did a letter just this past month saying I'm doing a new catalog. If we want to do price increases, I have to in the U.S. because of air cargo. Um, air cargo has 50% to 100% increase to get boxes in the U.S. Right now, getting pupa from Philippines is costing me $2 per pupa to get it to the U.S. And the Philippines are arguing over 50 cent pupa. That's not where the money's going. If you need more money to survive, ask, because that's not where the, the cost is. So, so that's always been my recommendation. So um, politically wise, process wise, uh, good luck. <laughs> I, I'll help if I can. But I, I'm just trying to keep the uh, supply chain side supported, at least on this side. And I'm glad to hear most people think it's still normal in the U.S. I could give you horror stories, but I'm glad that, that, that we got it still functioning. Dan, do you want to share some horror stories? Or where is the market of your cupe uh, going in the next? I, I'm sure that a lot of exhibits didn't even import. Well, they didn't open up last year. so. You probably didn't have many customers either, correct? I had three, and two of them weren't open. They just honored the contract. Uh, hats off to them, and congratulations to everybody that's still alive in this. This is a great industry. Um, been in a long time. The breeders, exhibitors, we have something really good. And I'm afraid, you know, listen to everybody's story. I, you know, I have my story, but you guys' story is, in my opinion, is much worse. I, I wrote down a few things here. To me, the three major things, major problems we have is one is pricing. The Philippines is a perfect scenario. If you keep lowering your price, you're not going to go anywhere. You're not going to ever expand. You're done. You just can't keep keep going down like that. It's a, it's a dead end. The shipping costs. Um, Rich is right. I mean, we got killed on shipping this year. Uh, we were doing double day shipping, two day shipping, cut the cost all these years, and then FedEx basically didn't guarantee two-day shipping and we lost and lost and lost so I, I i can assure you all the customers that we're gonna be doing uh next year the prices for shipping we have to we have to break even on this we can't i can't lose any more money on that um that, that's a big deal we've lost a lot of breeders in florida this year the last last two years and i've you know, been in a long time and um you know that's concerning um so on, on just a couple things on the shipping, you know, uh, uh, Mike, uh, I hope you're on there. You had made a statement. We, this is years, years and years ago. We the beers would get together and we have these little sit downs. And one of the big problems was okay. I do everything on my end. Can you hear me? We do everything on our end to get the package shipped, and then exhibitors expecting that package doesn't get there. Something happens on the way. And what's been happening that I've seen is um, the majority of the time, the breeder eats it, you know, it should be 50-50. If you, if you can prove that you ship the package, the package didn't get there, you know, it, the easiest way, uh, I think the right thing to do is split the cost, okay? And hopefully it doesn't happen again, but that was a big problem. And it's a big problem in the U.S. right now. I can't tell you how many packages we sent out, we sent them out on Monday and they were live the following Monday. But that's, you know, that's minor in, in the big picture. Um, so pricing, shipping, it sounds to me like Rich and, and, and the other people speaking, Sergio and stuff, it's political clout. And each and every one of you exhibitors, I mean, uh, breeders, you're working on your own. You're, you're fighting this battle day in and day out. And, you know, there's the truth of the matter is, you're so busy running your, your farm and this and that to go fight another battle. And that's not your, probably your expertise. If we had political clout in the IABS, and I have to ask you a question. We, in this, in this association, we probably have the majority of exhibits around the world that are members. And we've got, you know, the breeders, there's, there's going to be a, a cap um, where you're not going to go any higher. But if we're going to have political clout, we need a heck of a lot more members. So who is that? That's the individuals out, outside in this, this universe. If you ask the question, 
in, in, in the world, how many people know what IABES stands for? I'd say it's less than a thousand. I think we, you know, to get that cloud. So if you have a problem in Costa Rica or the Philippines, and we have somebody like a Wayne or, you know, Wheeling, you know, somebody that, you know, can explain to them what, you know, how valuable this is to not only to, to us, but to your country, you know, and, and do it that way, get a backup system. It's just some thoughts, but um, our, for me or for our farm, you know, our prices are going up. I can't, I can't uh, do what we did the last two years. And of course the two year, you know, 2020 is one story, but this year was a beating with the shipping and that has to end um, no longer we can take a hit on that it has to be has to be even on that um but overall we're you know we're going to be fine um, i'm more concerned of, of the overall picture i mean obviously you don't want the, the industry to to be it's i mean everyone every one of y'all that have spoke uh, it has has a concern and it it sounds like it's political clout and the shipping is, are the two main well and and the pricing those three things and they need to be addressed seriously um, I, I can't imagine in the Philippines. I mean, I don't think the prices of rich have the prices raised in the last 20 years in the Philippines. At, at this point, I have seen very little change in the Philippines since I started. You know, like you say, there's competition. Nobody's really, you know, everybody's scared to raise the prices. So, you know, the inflation goes up. You're keeping that that pupa at the same price year after year, 20 years. So now it's it's. I, I just don't see. I don't see how you can survive doing that. Um, of course, you can't. You know, in America, you can't have you know set price and everybody's going to agree to it. But I think the exhibitors need to know that you you might be saving a buck here and there, but you're killing that farm. That, that's what's happening. Well, well for my end, I agree, and I'm sure the the majority of our exhibitors are at least sympathetic to these issues. There's always these problems of our exhibit not having enough money. And uh, we were closed for three, four months. I just read there for some others were closed for a whole year. Um, the pressure is from all different sides, of course, but uh, we are representing the butterfly industry. And uh, everybody needs to understand that uh, it's very tightly connected. If we push the prices down or keep them down and not willing to, uh, we won't have a supply. I mean, my biggest worries, and I'm sure that's shared by the other exhibitors that are here, uh, there were months that we did not have a shipment coming, even though we were finally open or were nervous about it and then knowing some people or having a good network of suppliers, several suppliers in this case, uh, helps out. I'm not sure if we forgot any breeder that's on here who would like to chime in, but uh, <coughs> otherwise I'll open up for the last 10 minutes for general, general concerns, questions, and comments. I know that uh, the importers like Sharka She'll have to say more tomorrow, um, but as the European point on this, today we're more in Americas, but it's all interconnected, I guess. And Esto never came back, correct? We don't have El Salvador either. I feel, uh, Uli, I don't know if, if Francisco can hear it because I think somebody replied, but it's just a phone number. And I see a background Let's, noise, but yeah, I don't know who's that. I believe that's Fran it. Francisco with the eight four eight number. I believe yeah. he can hear us. Can you can you speak, Francisco? He's trying, I guess. No, looks like. Somewhere. And it was very much appreciated that you're here or trying to be with us. Uh, <laughs> you're definitely part of the group. Any uh, any more comments from the industry leaders, joiners? Vanessa raised again her hand. Yes. Hello. Yes. Uh, not just to, to comment that uh, 
for example, we, we had to raise our prices to our farmers in order to keep them interested in the, in the activity. And um, uh, the, because of the political situation of Colombia, raise the dollar, the, the, the currency change, uh, it's helping us right now. So I take advantage of it to fix a little bit our prices and stimulate our, our farmers. Uh, so, so we find a way to, to deal with the farmers and, and, and make an agreement with them according to the uh, currency, currency change of dollar. Uh, and this is good because we can, we can move uh, with this uh, situation of, the, of our currency. And, uh, however, we, we are not raising prices to our clients or exhibitors because we know the, the, the delicate and difficult situation of the industry. So that's just an idea I wanted to share uh, if maybe it's possible to, to, to handle with all, in other countries, I don't know. I, I know, for example, with the Philippines, the, 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 the change, the currency change is, is helping them with uh, managing very low prices to clients. However, uh, it's not good to, to risk the, the stability of, of the business because if we are not okay, we cannot help our farmers in the countryside. So just, just this comment. Anybody else raise their hands in Zoom? You just push on that button on the bottom there and you can raise your hands or just chime in and unmute um, yourself. I'm trying to find the raise hand button, but I can't find it. So I'll stick my hand up. It's under reactions. Ah, anyway. there you go. Look at that. Perfect. And um, too. Yeah, I just thought that while, while I'm here, I'll just give a, a kind of two bit of what our position is for the last year. So obviously during, during 2020 and 2021, it's all been a bit of chaos because of the pandemic, but of course we've had the Brexit to deal with as well. So um, moving Brexit aside, I would say that, COVID has been responsible for a, a loss of orders on about 25%. So we're down about 25% of our customers throughout Europe. Um, so it's been a bit tricky. So we were buying from about 11 different suppliers pre-2020. Um, and most of the time we were actually consolidating all our shipments. So with Ecuador, we were consolidating. Philippines, we still consolidate. Costa Rica, we consolidate. Africa, we consolidated our suppliers. Um, but unfortunately, since the pandemic, we've actually lost about five of our suppliers as well. We just don't have the numbers to justify buying in from multiple places. Partly that's because uh, of, of, of numbers and the way we price structure our pupa. So for us to, to be kind of competitive or to be actually able to do what we do, we need to try and buy as many pupa from our, our suppliers as possible and have the people to buy them from us. So if we've got most of our supplier or customers trying to buy from one region, and then we say, okay, well, we'll only get a very small amount of people from another region. If that shipping is then going to cost us a thousand dollars almost, then you're putting on a dollar per pupa. So we were running at a loss for nearly all of, all of 2020. And I think coming through 2021, we're pretty much just breaking even. So it's been an absolute nightmare. We're hopeful that shipping is going to kind of improve, um, but then that's what then brings us into Brexit. So it's all very well and good bringing everything into the United Kingdom. We've then got to be able to supply it into Europe. So when we've lost so many of our customers and we're trying to, uh, to consolidate as much as possible, we then have to think, well, what's the best option? So we were still at the moment getting everything into the United Kingdom and then selling a consolidated package of lots and lots of shipments out to Europe. But that costs us, well, that's, 1400 pounds so it's looking at about 1800 2000 dollars this week we shipped 10 parcels to europe and spent 2000 dollars doing it so you know the the money just isn't there so from next year from next january we're actually doing our entire business importing and exporting we're going to be doing directly from holland so we're actually shipping our business all the way over to holland and we're just doing it all from there 
So that takes me back to some of the other issues where, you know, we would love to help as many of our suppliers as we possibly can. And I know through COVID, we really, really, really did our best. But unfortunately, there just isn't a possibility to be able to, to keep every single supplier. Um, in doing so, you know, we've, we've, we've managed to kind of go back to some of our, our original suppliers and just stick with as much as we can with the people that we've worked with for 25 years, especially with um, Jacob, for example. So we've been doing our best with that, but unfortunately we just can't, we can't help everyone and lose money at the same time, which is what we've been doing. Um, on a point that Sergio made earlier about lead times, I think that's one of the most important things I just wanted to bring up. A lot of our customers, and I think part of the issue we've got here, we've got 49 people here, and I think we're going to have however many we'll have tomorrow. And that's the people who are actually genuinely interested in, in, in the business and understand it. There's so many of the, the butterfly exhibitors around the world that won't be here for this and never turn up for conferences and have to be really chased to pay their, their, their fees. They don't really want to know about all these complicated issues they just want their pupa they want to do their display they want to make some money and then they want to close it down for the winter and then they'll start up again they don't understand the lead time so why we've kind of had to go back to some of our basics is to be able to work with suppliers who genuinely understand how we do things we understand how they do things and we can work as best as we can so that we can talk to each other as quickly as possible i know sharka spends most of the nights uh, dealing with either a Philippine supplier, with Jacob, with uh, Costa Rica. We're, we're trying to buy in from all around the world at the same time, every single week, get it to Europe, while hoping that everybody's understanding that when the pupa doesn't turn up a day it should do, and it might be a day later, they decide they don't, they're not going to pay for it, or they're not in to pick it up, they're not going to do it. So logistics is an absolute nightmare. Lead times, it's... It's kind of a, it's really good that Sergio made that point because so many people just don't understand that it's not so simple as saying, I want my pupa tomorrow, can you get it to me tomorrow? It just doesn't work like that. Um, we would love to be able to say, well, do you know what, you guys put your box together with these guys, I and mean, as soon as it arrives, we'll just split it up and send it off. But again, we, we've tried that recently and, and it doesn't work for our tax either. So we import and we have to declare exactly what's coming in and we have to pay tax on that. And then we get a tax inspection and they say, well, what happened to this half of your box? Why is that? And they don't like it. So we've, we've tried to do that as much as possible and we tried to support that, but it doesn't always work. Um, I've been making points. So uh, I know Richard said that air cargo is increased by about 50% to 100%. That's exactly the same for us. It's increased dramatically to the point that um, I think we're just doing our prices this week and I think we've been communicating with Francisco in El Salvador. I think the way it works is his pupa is going to cost us an extra dollar. So the Philippines is actually, un unlike with America, Philippines hasn't been as wildly, wildly as um, drastic for us. So that one's actually been relatively okay. But we have been able to actually increase prices on the Philippines every year uh, for the last few years. So mostly we've absorbed that onto ourselves so we haven't put that onto our customers. Uh, but we're paying about 30p, which is about 40 cents more for our Philippine suppliers than we were previously in the last five years ago. But we haven't actually put that onto our customers. So our profit margins are kind of going down. So since the last two years, we're now going to be losing money going forward. So prices are going to have to rise for customers. And I think you all here understand that. But the difficulty we're going to have is to everybody else who doesn't show quite such an interest in being here. So. That's just what I wanted to say. Um, and I kind of just reiterate what everybody said. It's just a, it's a shipping issue is, is I would say the biggest crisis that we're facing at the moment. Having said that with um, something that Galinda mentioned with courier firms, once we've got it here or we've got it into Holland, that's the easy part. Then we've got to deal with the couriers. So when the couriers then pick up the pupa, They'll just do what they want to do. And we have very, very little clout to be able to deal with them. We've, we've tried it in the past where we phone them up and say, this is what we're doing. This is what you need to do. As soon as you speak to somebody there and say it's live butterfly pupa, then you're, you're risking your entire business because they may well choose, you know what, we don't like this. We're not going to do it. I know Galinda's had serious issues with uh, FedEx. We've lost the ability to use TNT throughout Europe. Um, 
Others have not been able to use UPS. Um, and then we're having to find really niche market sort of uh, couriers who then charge double the price. And then of course, you know, there's only so much absorbing of these costs that can be done until the entire business is just completely useless. So um, there comes a, a time where you've got to be quite careful how you speak to the courier firms as well. And similarly with the airlines, um, I know that we had the issue with uh, United suddenly not shipping live animals, but I suppose at a time where they can hike prices up because everybody's using uh, air cargo rather than shipping on containers at the moment because of the container shortage, they, they, it's a supply and demand issue. They're going to do that as long as there's an issue at the ports with containers. Um, and if live animals is a faff and a bit of a, a, a nightmare for them to deal with, then why are they going to do it if they can go and just uh, stick an inordinate object that doesn't matter if it sits at an airport for a few days? So, yeah, we can use a bit of clout and, and try and work together as an organisation, but I think it comes with its own risks as well um, involved with that. But that's pretty much what I've written down and, and tried to remember. So I think that's that's all I've got to say. Well, thank you. And I'm sure everybody agrees with Mike's comment that together as Yavis, we have more political clout than if we approach these problems individually. Wayne, you want to comment? Yeah, I thought it's been percolating with me. I do a lot with honeybees. And I think it would be well advised for the board of directors of IABES to work through the World Trade Organization. They, they have a group that works specifically with animals called the World Organization for Animal Health. And then subdivided further yet is the office in France called the Office Internationale des Epizodes. And they establish all the um, international agreed upon standards for animal care and trade for the WTO. I, I would recommend we that, that the board of directors talk with them to get butterflies and moth pupae elevated to the level of animal trade. Um, You know, in, in my work with them in establishing packaging standards and shipping standards and practices for honeybees, it, it also puts them into the realm of a an airline cannot refuse the package just because, you know, somebody's afraid of being stung by a bee, that kind of thing. It's an international standard. If the package meets the international standards, then you have to handle it. You have to carry it. Um Within further into that is the International Air Transportation Association. I, I sent that to you, IATA. IATA. And um, again, they, they establish the standards that all airlines must follow. So I, I think getting butterfly pupae recognized as an animal and therefore setting up standards for packaging and shipment methods, but, but more importantly, requiring that the shipper accept the package um, would be a, a good way to go. Uh, I know that in the United States, our Fish and Wildlife Service is, is working now with butterfly and moth pupae to, to head in that direction, but uh, perhaps pushing through with them as well. I, I just think get, getting behind this and, and trying to push would be a good, uh, a good idea. That's all I've got. But a funny years ago, we were talking trying to get the Europeans to back off to treat pupae as live animals that had to be inspected by a veterinarian. Now we might be better off going the opposite direction. We are um, definitely 11.38 in my time here, uh, a little over the time that we had allotted. Uh, but I do not want to cut this discussion short if there is more that we need to discuss today or that we can maybe tag on to tomorrow's round of Asian breeders when we meet those guys and hear a little more about uh, probably the same issues, same problems that we already heard today. So Sergio, what say you? Oh, so I don't know if there are any other questions that you might want to ask. No? 
All right. So we well, can, of yeah. course, always celebrate and have a martini or something else here together. And that's usually what is part of these gatherings. Acknowledgement of each other's presences. There are a bunch of people that have not said a word. I realize that, um, including Maria, Carm, not Stefan, Asuncion has joined us. Some of my neighbors exhibit here, Marissa. Uh, there are a bunch of names I don't recognize. They're probably from the European uh, group. Um, would have loved to meet everybody and hear from everybody to introduce themselves, but this format is unfortunately not ideal for that sort of camaraderie. But if you want to say something, Lloyd, you Uli, want I to say we, something. I think that we do have one question from Chantal on the chat. If we have the pupae declared officially as live animals, we won't be able to use yeah. couriers anymore. Um, James. I yeah, I was, I was actually just writing back to Chantel on this. I was just going to say that I think if we were to, to specifically say that it's live animals, I think that's is that more of an international freight uh, scenario as opposed to internally with couriers. Mm -hmm. We don't write live animals on the box, but we do write butterfly pupa on the box. So there's every, every they understand exactly what's coming. So Chantel, for example, when we ship to you with all the commercial invoices and, and, and our invoices, it does specifically say uh, live butterfly pupa. So um, the couriers are aware of what they're shipping. And I know with, with us, with UPS, we have quite a good agreement and arrangement that goes up quite high. Um, but we, uh, I would say, I think what we were talking about earlier with uh, going down that we, Wayne was, was that more specifically for international shipping for air freight rather than within the couriers? Yeah, it's de definitely international shipping. Yeah. There goes the idea of light, uh, of bicycle couriers. <laughs> Vanessa, yeah. you raised your hand again. And Mathieu? Yes, uh, to mention that here in Colombia, we have a national market with uh, gifts with uh, alive butterflies. And uh, we uh, deal with the couriers, with national couriers, couriers to agree that uh, since pupa do not have locomotion, they are not flying because they are pupae and they are not uh, drinking water or, or they don't need, uh, they don't have needs as a pet or dog or cat. Uh, they are moving in different situations in the airplanes or rodders. Uh, they recognized uh, to transport our pupa as, as a handcraft, a delicate handcraft, a gift. Uh, so inside Colombia, we don't have a big issue about uh, transport. So maybe the, this idea can help. Not in Germany, probably. Uh, Mathieu, you had another comment too? Yes, I, I would like to, uh, two things. First of all, here in Ecuador, if I want to send a pupa from one city to another one in Ecuador, there is absolutely no way to do that. Uh, by declaring its live animals. Uh, FedEx, DHL will refuse any animal. And even if I want to sell dead butterflies, paper and butterflies, I cannot send them outside Ecuador or inside Ecuador. So it's very difficult. So I, when I send inside Ecuador, I send them as handicraft because this is the only way I can make it, very unfortunately. Uh, there is no way I have tried to solve that problem, but it was impossible. So, and my other question, which has nothing to do with the first um, point, is do you think there is an opportunity for us to meet again next year? Is there any plan to do so? Because it would be so nice. I really enjoyed when we met two years ago in, in Florida, and I really hope we can make it again because all the it's working very well with Zoom, uh, but it's not the same and it would be really nice, even if it, it would cost us a lot more money that we could meet again. Yes, uh, Galinda is our chief of parties, uh, sorry, conferences. Uh, and uh, there, there's definitely a call for that. Uh, we have a little bit of, uh, an interest from Costa Rica to explore, maybe even a little interest from 
uh, Ecuador to explore since that's so many years ago. Yes, Johanna, <laughs> we, we might see you in your place. Um, we, we would have to get a proposal to speak for Maria maybe, uh, or Galinda. We need a proposal or at least a willingness and then sort of an, a framework of what that could look like and how realistic it is. It's a little early to expect everybody to travel internationally on maybe company dime. It would cost us $2,000 a person to put out there. So uh, our institution hasn't come back yet to the financial well-being to sponsor trips to the Caribbean or to Costa Rica or uh, Ecuador. But uh, next year, we hope, we definitely hope that we can and we should be ready to do it if we can uh, and, and develop a plan. It's on the list. Linda? Yes, nodding. Yes. No, I, I'm definitely yes. saying that we have this on the list and we are talking about this already and hope to. Uh, everything needs a long time planning. So we have to define this perhaps at latest at the beginning of the year. Yeah, good year. <laughs> and another housekeeping item to close this out for today because I see some people have to leave. Um, don't forget, we do need two new board members and uh, those would be hopefully carrying the torch to be the World Trade Organizations or whoever to coordinate and help the industry. So consider that, consider who you know, who you want to lead this organization and actively participate. So as you back to you for final words and thank you to all. No, no, thank you. Well, I have to say, Uli, thank you so much for facilitating the session. We got up to 52 people joining at some point. So thank you all for staying tuned. We spent an hour and 45 minutes, and I think that it was an actively engaged in, engaging discussion. So I really appreciate everyone's attention. Uh, feel free, guys, to join tomorrow, right? We put, we, we, we wanted to have two sessions, one for Americas, one for Europe and, and for Asian and African. Um, but but it's open for everyone, right? So I hope that you all can join as well tomorrow at the same time. I think that it will be an interesting uh, follow-up call from, for some of the topics we discussed today. So feel free to join. Uh, we'll be uh, talking to Hussein, uh, speaking with our friends from the Philippines. I think we will have two suppliers, Beth and Jennifer. <laughs> BT as well, so we will have a, a good a good crew there, and it will be nice as well to hear from them what, what is going on. Uh, so thank you all once again. Uli, you want to say something else? Yes, uh, about these recordings uh, of these meetings. There are a bunch of people, and, and I mentioned in my email to invite everybody that actually works with the pupae. So it's not just the directors that usually show up or don't even work in the exhibit as much. There is an opportunity and there will not be everybody able to join us tomorrow as not everybody joined us yesterday, but there is a good chance for them maybe to review these meetings and listen to these discussions uh, after the meeting. So where Sergio will these recordings be hosted? We, also on our yeah. YouTube channel. No, we, we do probably we will rely on the on the Zoom recordings. So we got the links. They take about an hour or two hours to we, we, so that we can get them. And we might also be uploading them on YouTube. So uh, we, we, we are thinking about that, but we you will get the links uh, for sure. I, I think that on that note, Uli, I think that is important that I see lots of faces. Some of you are the owners of the exhibit. Some of you are employer, employees of the exhibit. But if you think that the topics that are being discussed here should be raised above you to your supervisor, director, um, manager of the exhibit, please do so. I think that we need to have more people aware of the challenges that you all are dealing with. And this is not just you guys dealing with the pupil box, but it's really something that should be concerning the top uh, hierarchies of your exhibits as well. So I hope that you can also pass that message. Uh, but once again, thank you so much. I don't want to take more time of, of your day and we will be speaking tomorrow. And once again, Uli, thank you so much for leading the session. You did a great job. Great job, man. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, guys. See you tomorrow.
Bye. 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 Yes, thank Bye you. Bye, everyone. See y'all. Bye. Thank you. Bye, guys. See you later, my friend.